In the previous lecture, we talked about the general purpose bootstrap. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about using the bootstrapping for prediction, either for calculating prediction errors or for improving predictions from particular types of prediction models like classification trees or regression models. Bootstrapping can be used for cross-validation type error rates. It can be used for prediction errors and regression models. But most importantly, it can be used to improve prediction in very clever ways. So first we're going to be talking about bootstrapping prediction errors. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the same uh, data set that we used previously, this nuclear data set and the boot package. We're going to fit a linear model relating the log of the cost to the date that the reactor was created. And then what we're going to do is plot the uh, observed values that we have, the date versus the log cost, and the fitted values in red. One thing that we might want to know is if we make a new prediction, how confident we would be in that prediction. So what we can do is actually generate a new, a new set of values that's equal to um, the predictions that happen for specific dates. So here we're going to use dates between 65 and 72. We're going to create a sequence of those values of length 100 equally spaced between 65 and 72. Then what we're going to do is attach to this nuclear data set the residual values that we get from the nuclear uh, regression model and the fitted values that we get from that same regression model. We're then going to use the bootstrap function applied to our nuclear data set with these values attached. We're going to use the nuke function to calculate the statistic we care about. We're going to do 1,000 replications. And we're also going to pass to the boot function this new data set that we get when we uh, create these values from 65 to 72. So what we're going to do then is use this nuke function. The nuke function takes the data set, in this case the nuclear data set, and a set of indices, in this case INDS, which will be the randomized or bootstrap sample data indices, and then the new data, which is the value that we're going to get from this particular extra argument. What this does is it calculates a linear model fit that takes the fitted values from the original regression model, adds in a sampled set of the residuals, so adds in different kinds of noise bootstrapped sampled noise, and then fits a linear model relating that new value to the date. Th what this is trying to do is generate data that have the same trend observed in the original data set plus noise that is about the same order of magnitude of the original data set, but is randomized using this INS, uh, inde index. We can then calculate a new prediction for the data set of the new values for each of these bootstrap linear models and return the predicted values. It turns out that if we look at the test statistic that comes out of this new bootstrap sample, what we get are 1,000 replications for each of the 100 values from 65 to 72. So what we can do is plot the fitted values in black, the predicted values that we get by predicting from our original linear model object to the new data values. We can then calculate the standard deviations of the test statistics that we get for each of those 100 values. What this command does is it calculates the standard deviation of each column of, that, uh, of this statistic t. There are 100 columns, one column corresponding to each new data value, and each new data value is predicted 1,000 bootstrap times, and so we can calculate the standard deviation of those predictions for each value. We can then plot, in addition to the fitted values, the prediction plus 1.96 times the standard errors that we get for each column. What that shows is, and we can also do the same thing for the um, opposite side of that uh, prediction interval, we can calculate uh, the predicted values minus 1.96 times the predicted standard deviations. What you can see here in red are the prediction intervals for our predicted values. So near the center of the distribution where there's a lot of data points, we get very accurate predictions. But near the ends where we have fewer data points, we get much less accurate predictions. 
So that's how the bootstrap can be used to calculate prediction errors. Next we're going to be talking about how bootstrapping can be used to produce, improve prediction accuracy. So the basic idea here is to resample the cases or resample the observations that we have, recalculate the predictions, and then either average those predictions if we're doing a regression with a quantitative outcome, or do a majority vo vote when we have a binary or categorical response. So important, this seems like a pretty simple idea, and it almost seems like you're taking too much advantage of the data because we're just resampling the data, recalculating the predictions, and averaging them. It's not clear why this would improve accuracy intuitively. However, bootstrap aggregating in general results in similar bias to the original estimates that you would calculate if you didn't do bootstrap aggregating, but it also reduces the variance of those, observ of those predictions leading to a lower mean squared error and in general lower error rates. It's particularly useful when you're doing prediction with nonlinear functions rather than with linear models where the bootstrap aggregating values will be very very similar to the values that you would get just from predicting using the linear model itself. So first we're going to take a look at what happens when you bag the low S model. So what we're going to do is use the uh, data set ozone that appears in the package uh, LM stat learn. We're going to order the ozone values by the ozone variable. And the reason why is, again, when we're plotting the values, it makes it easier to plot them when they're ordered by what the x-axis is going to be in our plots. If you look at the data set, we have ozone values, radiation values, temperature values, and wind values. What we can then do is create a bagged low S curve, and here's how we're going to do it. So what we do is for each of 10 different samples, we take a sample with replacement from the rows of the ozone matrix, and we generate a new ozone matrix, which is sampled with replacement from those rows. We then reorder that subsampled matrix by the ozone variable just to make it easier to, to create plots. Each time we create a, an ozone ver uh, matrix that has uh, a subsampled values, we fit a low S curve relating temperature to the ozone variable. Here we're going to be fixing the span equal to 0 0.2 to illustrate a point, although in general you don't necessarily need to fix the span. We're then going to use the predict function to predict from our low S fitted objects a new data set at the specified values of ozone from 1 to 155. If you plot each of the fitted low S curves in gray against, against the fitted data, you get something that looks like this. So on the x-axis is ozone, on the y-axis is temperature, each of the dots is an observed value. Every time that we take a bootstrap sample and recalculate our low S curve, we get a different gray line. And you can see that they're wiggly. Some are high, some are low, and they vary across each different line. If we take the average value at every different data point, we get the red line. You can see that the red line is less wiggly, but still kind of goes through the middle of the data points. This is the bagged version of the low S curve, and it will in general have a lower error rate than any of the individual bootstrap curves or the low S model that we would fit on the original data using a span of 0 0.2. In addition to using bagging for nonlinear uh, smooth functions like low S, we can bag regression trees or classification trees. So what we typically do is resample the data, recalculate trees, and then either take the average or the mode of the predictors. The mode being the most common value that a particular uh, sample is assigned to. Some nice things about bag trees are that they are more stable, but they might not be as good as what are called random forests, which is something we'll talk about in the next couple of slides as well. So to show you how this works, I'm going to use the iris data. So this data can be loaded by typing data iris, and you get, again, the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, and species of a particular set of iris uh, samples. So to get a bagged tree, we can actually use the ipred uh, package. And what we do is we tell, we use the term bagging, 
we use the outcome on the left hand side in this case species then here I'm saying tilde dot which means I'm going to fit a model including all of the other terms other than species that appear in this data set iris so this will be petal width petal length sepal width and sepal length and here I say COOB equals true this says calculate the out of bag classification error is what this is saying what it means by the out of bag classification error is in each bootstrap sample we sample with replacement of the same the same size as the original data set this means some certain values will be left out since some values will be repeated more than once what this does is it calculates the error rate on those samples that are left out of our regression tree this can be an estimate of our cross validation error if you then type print bag tree you get the call of the original uh, bagging uh, uh, function you get the number of bootstrap replications that were performed in this case it's the default 25 and you get to see the out of bag misclassification error in other words only about six percent are misclassified out of bag we can then go and look at each specific bag tree if we'd like to so we look at the bag tree object we look at the trees that are generated if we look at the first tree and look at the B tree component of that, we actually see that the first tree had a split, for example, on petal length less than 2.5 near the top node. You can then look at the second tree, which has a slightly different split. In this case, it's the petal length is less than 2.6. So it's a little bit different than the original one. And we'll, this second tree will give a slightly different classification. You can then get the classification for the overall bag tree by calculating the most common value that is predicted for any particular leaf. I'm not going to talk too much more about bag trees because the more common use is random forests. So random forests are very similar to bag trees except we do one extra step. So again we bootstrap the samples but then at each at split we take a bootstrap sample of the variables. We then grow multiple trees and we do a voting procedure. So in this case, we generate not only multiple trees by bootstrapping the samples, within each sample we generate multiple trees by bootstrapping the variables so that we get a set of, not just a set of trees, we get a forest. The pros of this approach are its high accuracy in real examples. The cons can be, it can be a little bit slow, it's incredibly hard to interpret what it means to get a vote of multiple trees and you can, it's prone sometimes to overfitting depending on the structure of the training data set. So I'm going to show you how this works for a random forest function for the iris data. So the random forest function appears in the random forest package and it works a lot like the same uh, along the same lines as the linear model function or other functions that we've seen that use a formula. On the left hand side is the thing that we're trying to predict the outcome species then a tilde then the variables that we'd like to predict with separated by plus signs and then the data set where we'd like to obtain those variables from I also have set this variable prox equals true and I'll show you why in just a minute if you look at the objects that's generated what it shows you are the out of bag error rate so again, that's that error rate that's calculated on the samples that are left off in any particular bootstrap subsample. It tells you the number of variables it tries at each particular split. In this case, it only tries one variable. The number of trees that are calculated. In this case, it calculated 500 separate trees. And then it gives you a confusion matrix. So what the confusion matrix is, is it tells you for the number of times that this category is the category of iris, how many times do we predict each of the other subcategories? So the values that appear on the diagonal are the times that we got it right. That's the times where um, the value was the same in both the real data set and in the predicted data set. And the off diagonal values are the values that we misclassified. So you can actually look at a particular single tree from this forest object by using the get tree command. So this is the first or the second tree for the forest iris object. So this tells you 
what the values of each of the splits are. So this tells you that the left uh, daughter gets a value of 2 and the right daughter gets a value of 3. It tells you which variable would split on, what it split the value on, and the prediction at the end of the, uh, the, that particular leaf. You can also look at the centers that are calculated for each particular uh, class. So the centers are sort of like the medians for the k-nearest neighbors, or the centroids for the k-nearest neighbors, or k-means uh, uh, classification. So what you can do is you can calculate the class centers for the iris variables using the uh, proximity variables that were calculated in the uh, random forest function. We can then plot the petal length versus the petal width and then what we can do is we can color them by the um, uh, value of the species that they belong to. So in this case, we see that there are three clusters of species here. It's separated by these two variables. We can then add the cluster centers as the centers calculated using this class center variable. And we can color them also by the category centers. And we can see that the centers that we get appear to be in the centers of the cluster. An important component of the random forest uh, function is that we can actually combine random forests across multiple trees and this is an advantage because then you can co computationally calculate this on multiple computers at the same time. So for example these three commands all fit random forest objects with 50 trees each. We can then use the combine command to combine these three sets of trees into one overall larger number of sets of trees. So what this can be done, what this can uh, be useful for is calculating each of these on a different uh, processor then combining them all together at the end to speed up computational time. You can predict new values using the predict function just like with all the other uh, classification tools that we've looked at. So if I generate a new data set that has sepal lengths, widths, petal length, widths, and lengths, all generated from distributions that have the same mean and distribution and standard deviation as the original variables in the iris data set, I can predict those new values using our uh, iris, uh, forest iris object. The reason why I'm doing this is to show you the prediction boundaries. So in this case, all of the green points are points that would have been predicted for one class. All of the blue points are the points that would be predicted for another. And all of the red points would be the points that were predicted for another class. Something that's easy to see from this plot is that it's not exactly straight lines that separate these different categories. And in fact, you can see that there are these sort of strange shapes that correspond to different subcategories that are classified in different areas. So this important point is that random forests can actually capture structure that isn't necessarily separated well by a line or by any sort of standard shape. So uh, a few notes and further resources on bootstrapping prediction models. It's particularly useful for nonlinear models, so if you're doing things with standard linear models, bootstrapping may or may not help you. Care should be taken to avoid overfitting. As you saw in the previous slide, the, the random forest uh, classification boundaries can end up being quite wiggly and can end up uh, classifying specific points very closely by their data if you have a lot of variables in the random forest classification. So for example, you might want to use something like the random forest cross-validation function, which I've linked to here. Out-of-bag estimates are efficient estimates of the test error because you'll always be leaving out um, a few samples when you do your bootstrapping and you can calculate the error rate directly on those samples without the need for an extra cross-validation step. Some further resources that might be useful are the very in-depth discussion of random forests created by the co-authors that developed random forests, the random forest Wikipedia page, uh, the Wikipedia page on bagging, and then this very nice introduction to bagging and boosting that appears um, in a set of lecture notes.